As you might know, I created this 10x10 RGB LED matrix that can display mesmerizing pictures and animations during a previous project video. And while it is certainly an eye catcher, I think it is a shame that once you upload your animations to the built-in Arduino Nano, you can only watch the LEDs going through the codes and not select your favorite light show whenever you want. That sounds like a job for the ESP8266, which is a microcontroller with built-in Wi-Fi that features 160 KB bytes of memory, 16 GPIO pins, SPI, I2C, I2S, and ADC, and ADC, and much more. Seems like a suitable choice for our project, but recently, and with recently I mean in 2016, the successor of the ESP8266 was released, the ESP32. This one offers a higher clock speed, more memory, Bluetooth support, more GPIOs, LDAC, and even sensors like a temperature, hole, or touch sensor. So even though this microcontroller is definitely an overkill for my project upgrade, I will show you in this video how easy slash difficult it is to use such a microcontroller and in the end demonstrate how you can use it to control any kind of project through Wi-Fi. Let's get started. First off, we should visit ESP32.net, which does not only offer tons of information about the microcontroller, links to different tutorials and details about all the different development boards, but also a list of the currently available development software. While there is a variety to choose from, I want to be lazy and stick with the one I'm familiar with, the Arduino IDE. After clicking the link, a GitHub page was presented, which offered the Arduino core for the ESP32. Perfect! To install it, I simply followed the given installation instructions, which means I installed the newest Arduino IDE version, followed by the installation of Git and afterwards used the program to download the GitHub data and moved it into the corresponding Arduino folder. Once that was done, I started the Arduino IDE and noticed a couple of new ESP32 options in the board selection section of the software. But the question was which one to choose? Now I got my ESP32 board for cheap from China. And luckily it was not only the manufacturer mentioned on the back, but the exact board type was also listed in the board selection. That means it was time to connect the ESP32 to the computer and have a look at a couple of the included example sketches. As you can see, there are quite a lot of different functions of the microcontroller presented through the example sketches. And even the GitHub page says that most of the framework is implemented. Only the analog write function is missing, but you can use alternatives for that. So as a first test, let's see whether the whole sensor sketch works. After opening it, all we have to do is to check whether the COM port is correct and then click upload. As soon as the software says that it is connecting, we have to hold down the boot button on the ESP32 board until a successful connection was established. Afterwards, the upload executes automatically, and after opening the serial monitor and changing the baud rates, we can see that by bringing a magnet close to the ESP32, the values of the serial monitor increase or decrease depending on which pole is aligned with the microcontroller. Of course, this sketch has a more visual appeal when using the serial plotter, but either way it means that the code and board functions correctly. So after I tried out a second sketch, the touch read sketch, which changes the values of the serial monitor according to whether I touch a specific pin, it was time to control the LED matrix. The Arduino code I used so far utilized the fast LED library to control the WS2812 addressable LEDs. Since they require a precise timing of the high and low states, which represent the digital 1 and 0. Luckily though, the ESP32 is apparently supported by the fast LED library. So I created a simple example code, uploaded it to the ESP32 
removed the data wire from the Arduino and instead connected it to the pin 23 of the ESP32, which I defined beforehand as the data pin. After then connecting the ground of the ESP32 to the ground potential of the matrix and powering it all through my lab bench power supply, we can observe two problems. But firstly, it is a positive aspect to note that even though the ESP32 sends out 3.3V signals, the 5V WS2812 LEDs seem to react kind of accordingly, even though the datasheet states a minimum data in voltage of 3.5V. But then again, random colors seem to light up periodically and the test animation of the traveling white LED is way too fast. It seems like the delay function was altered through the fast LED library. So in conclusion, I cannot use this library for the LED matrix upgrade. Thankfully though, I soon found the ESP32 digital RGB LED drivers on GitHub. It seems to utilize the RMT peripheral of the microcontroller, which is the remote control module driver for infrared remotes. So to test it, I downloaded the GitHub files, opened the included demo sketch, uploaded it to the board, connected it back to the matrix and powered it all up in order to see that this code seems to work just fine. As a last test, I altered the code in a way that it is basically the same test code I tried earlier with the fast LED library, with the only difference that this time the code worked flawlessly, which means it was time to add the Wi-Fi parts to the project upgrade. The example sketches for the ESP32 contain a simple Wi-Fi server sketch, which is basically exactly what we need. After including the SSID and password of my network, I uploaded the code, checked the IP address of the ESP32 through my router, entered this IP address in a browser and was greeted with the text which was programmed beforehand onto the microcontroller. Here we can select whether we want to turn on or off pin 5, which does in fact work if we measure the voltage at the pin with a multimeter. That means this concept of Wi-Fi control does work fine, but I actually do not want to control the LED matrix through a browser. So I removed most of the server client codes and replaced it all with a few simple lines, which simply check what was entered after the IP address of the entered URL. In this example, I have to enter slash picture slash one to turn on the GPIO pin or slash picture slash two to turn off the GPIO pin. But since I do not want to turn on or off a GPIO pin, I change the code once again to alter the value of a variable called picture instead, which I can use in the code to activate different LEDs and thus create different pictures which after a short test seem to work flawlessly with the LED matrix. Of course, those are only static pictures. If I would want to create fluent animations, I would have to check periodically whether a Wi-Fi client is available, which means we would need a timer interrupt or something similar. So let's rather not focus on this difficult problem right now. Instead, let's get rid of this annoying URL entering every time we want to change the picture. For that, I visited the MIT App Inventor website, which is a very easy way to create your own Android applications. There I created a new project, added a text box for entering the IP address, two buttons to switch between the two pictures and the web connectivity feature. Next, I moved on to the block programming section of the app, which simply contains of two blocks which say that when a button is pushed, we want to set the URL to http slash slash the IP address we entered in the text box slash picture slash one or two. Afterwards, we simply execute a web.get command which enters the URL and the project was complete. All that was left to do was to install the app on my phone and giving it a try. Now, as you can see, entering the IP address does work without a problem but once I click a button, there is an error message popping up. It basically says that we get no information from the server, since we used the web.get function, but since it entered the URL anyway, the program does in fact work with the LED matrix without a problem. 
At this point, we could of course improve the Android app and the ESP32 code even more to get rid of the error message or add more buttons or play back fluent animations and whatnot. But I think this project so far already gave you a good idea that it is actually not hard to utilize the ESP32 in a project. Needless to say, a couple of functions do not work perfectly yet. But most of it works certainly good enough to create a few dozens of awesome projects. And with that being said, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If so, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Consider supporting me through Patreon to keep such videos coming. Stay creative and I will see you next time.